Today I'm going to preach a message that we're titling Victory Over the Virus. Come on, let's say that together. Victory Over the Virus. The virus is real, guys. As of yesterday, 150,000 people worldwide have tested positive for the coronavirus. 5,700 people have died. That's 5,700 people too many. Amen? But I want to put that number in perspective for everybody. Last year, 646,000 people died worldwide from the flu. 5,700 people have died so far from the coronavirus this year. Over a half a million people, over 600,000 people died last year worldwide from the flu. The CDC also estimated this week that 31 million Americans have caught the flu so far this year. Over 300,000 of which have been hospitalized. Of the 150,000 who have tested positive this year for the coronavirus, half of them have made a full recovery. Do you know the coronavirus? Yeah, come on, man. Thank God for that. The coronavirus was discovered in the 1960s. If you go home and you take your Lysol can out and you rotate it to the back, you'll notice on the back label of your Lysol can that it is a disinfectant for the coronavirus. If you go home and you look underneath your sink, that's where all my stuff stays. That's where all our stuff stays, the cleaning products. If you grab your Clorox wipes out from underneath your sink and you look at the back label, you'll see on the Clorox label that those wipes are a disinfectant for the coronavirus. It is not a new thing. It is new in the news, but it is not a new thing. The CDC says one of the reasons why, and I did this research yesterday, to make sure that I was up to date. One of the reasons why so many people are testing positive right now is because people are actually being tested for the coronavirus. But it is still a big deal. 5,700 people dying is a big deal. But today I want to remind you of a few things. Those of you who are home today, those of you who are watching online today, I want to remind you of a few things. The Bible says in John 10.10 that Satan comes to do three things. He comes to steal, he comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. The first thing the enemy does is he steals. And if the enemy can invoke fear in our life, he will steal your peace, he will steal your sleep, He will steal your joy. He will steal your resources. He comes to steal. This week, March Madness was canceled. Last year, March Madness generated $10 billion, with a B, dollars in revenue. The most expensive thing you can do is live in fear. Fear is expensive. It will cost you. And it cost, March Madness, $10 billion in revenue. This week, Disneyland and Disney World Parks have closed for two weeks. And I'm not giving you these numbers to say shame on March Madness. Shame on Disney. I'm giving you these numbers to help you realize how expensive it is to live in fear. So this week, Disneyland, Disney World said we're going to close all of our parks for two weeks. Do you know that the Disney franchise, their parks generate $16 billion, with a B, dollars in revenue every day. Yes, every day from their parks. Fear is expensive. Fear is costly. The most expensive thing that you can do is choose to live a life in fear. This week the NBA canceled their games. Last week, or I'm sorry, last year, NBA, the NBA generated $8 billion. Everybody say B, with a B, $8 billion in revenue. And they canceled their games. The most expensive thing, I'm going to say this over and over until we get it in our heart. The most expensive thing that we can do as people is choose to live in fear. Fear is costly. 
In the 1990s, we faced a different scare, the millennial bug, also known as Y2K. How many of you guys remember Y2K? On midnight of the year 2000, the world was going to come to a halt. Everything that we know was going to be turned upside down. The thought process is developers had not thought about what would happen to electronics when the calendar flipped over from 99 to 2000. So the idea was, and this is what the media said, planes will literally fall from the sky. Trains will stop in their tracks. Your microwave will not work anymore. Your oven will not work anymore. Your computers will not work anymore. Power plants will fail. So people bought generators. People went and bought bunkers and buried them in the ground. Come on, maybe you did that. Tell me where your bunker is. I'm going to come steal your water. I'm going to come steal your canned food. People bought bulk of canned food, toilet paper. I started to post this week online. For everybody who comes to one of our services, we're giving out this week and this week only two-ply Charmin aloe vera toilet paper because we care about your butt had a church called home. It is estimated that the scare of Y2K cost the U.S. government $100 billion. The most expensive thing that you'll ever do in life is live in fear. Fear is expensive. Fear is costly. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. But God has given us a spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 25, get this in your heart. Listen to me. Do not be afraid when sudden panic arises. That's God's word. Do not be afraid when sudden panic arises. Matthew chapter 6 verse 34. Do not, this is Jesus, this is red letters right here. Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have its own worries. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with the spirit of thanksgiving, What are we going to thank God for? Thank God for His Word. Thank God that He has given us all a measure of faith. Thank God that we can believe for incredible things in the future. Thank God that we're not serving a God of regression, but a God of progression. A God who owns everything. A God who knows how to get water out of a rock. A God who knows how to get gold out of the mouth of a fish. A God who can take a lunchbox and feed thousands with it. But in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's not forget Psalm 91. If you guys can't tell, I'm a word person. The Bible says in Psalm 91 verse 5, Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night nor of the arrows that fly by day. Do not dread the diseases that stalk in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. I could continue on. The next verse says, Though a thousand fall at my side, and ten thousand at my right hand, it will not come near my dwelling. Amen? Why? Because I put the Chick-fil-A sauce on the doorpost of my house, right? The angel of Corona has got to pass over. Amen? No, because the blood of Jesus has been applied to my life. In the parable of the talents, one made an investment in faith and he doubled what he had. A second did the same. But a third in fear buried what he had been given. And Jesus rebuked him and took what he had And gave it to the others. Fear is 
expensive. Fear will cost you. The most expensive thing you can do is live in fear. Fear will cost you your health. Fear and worry are directly connected to heart disease. Now you have more to worry about. Amen? If you'll do the research, you'll find this to be true. Fear and worry are directly connected to cancer. See, when we talk about health, most of the time we talk about what we eat. And what we eat does matter. But what eats at us matters more. I want to be a word person, not a worried person. When everybody else is running for their life and hiding in isolation, I'm going to go to the mall and enjoy the clearance sale. Amen? I'm going to enjoy the ride at Dollywood because nobody else is there. Come on, we're going to look for the downside or the upside. I'm going to always be looking for the upside. Amen? Because I serve a God with whom all things are possible. And God knows how to turn everything that was meant for my evil into good. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, the people of God. Come on, give God a praise break on that right there. Fear kept an entire generation from entering the promised land. Instead of walking in and enjoying the goodness of what God made for them, prepared for them. Because of fear, a generation died in the wilderness. I'm going to say it again. Fear is expensive. Fear will cost you your wealth, your health, your joy, your peace of mind. The most expensive thing we can do is live in fear. In 1803, British Parliament created a civil service position. This is a true story. Lean in. 1803, British Parliament created a civil service position requiring a man to stand on the cliff of Dover with a spyglass His duty was to look out against enemy invasion. It was believed that Napoleon and his army would invade. So for 142 years, someone stood on the cliff with a spyglass looking for Napoleon. I think that just went over everybody's head. Let me say it again. For 142 years, Years, someone looked for Napoleon. How long does the average person live? The job was eliminated in 1945. Even though Napoleon died May 5th, 1821. This is a true story. For 124 years... They wasted time, they wasted energy, and they wasted money looking for an enemy who could no longer do them any harm. Jesus said, I saw with my own eyes Satan fall out of heaven like a boat of lightning. And behold, I give you the power and you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Praise God. I serve a God who is victorious over everything. And at the name of Jesus, everything in heaven, in earth, and under the earth bows to that name. Come on, thank God for the name of Jesus. According to psychologists, there are approximately 2,000 classified fears. What's interesting to me is that psychologists also say that we are all born with only two. We're born with a fear of loud noises. We're born with a fear of falling. But there are 2,000 classified fears. You know there's a fear of Wednesdays? I read in Time Magazine 
Just last month, they did a monthly thick, pretty color page magazine all about psychology and fear. And I read one entire article on the fear of Wednesday. Are you kidding me? It's like, that's like the best day because Geico has that hump day commercial, you know, with the camel. I was like, man, I love hump day, right? Fear. You know what that tells me? It tells me that heaven pre-programmed us to be people of faith, not people of fear. A child believes like nobody else. And Jesus said, you have to accept the kingdom like a child. From the moment we become followers of Jesus, Jesus is trying to get us back to a childlike faith. True story. Fear triggers more than 1,400 known physical and chemical responses, which in turn activate more than 30 different hormones within the body. As God's people... We are not to be reactive when crisis occurs. We're to be proactive. We're to be wise, yes. We're to be responsible, yes. That's why today we triple wiped everything down. That's why today we told our greeting team, hey, don't initiate a handshake. If somebody wants to shake your hand, fist bump them. Shake their hand if they want to shake. If you don't mind to shake, let's be wise. Let's be responsible. But we're not to be reactive. We're to be proactive in being wise, being responsible, but more than anything, to rise up in moments of crisis and proclaim the hope we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible says don't forget His benefits. He forgives all of our sin and He heals every disease. Come on, one more time. Thank God for Jesus. Let me talk for a moment about what fear is not. Fear is not the absence of faith. You can have faith and still be afraid. Amen? I said you can have faith and still be afraid. But when your fear is greater than your faith, then we have a problem. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus and His disciples, they were in a boat. And Jesus told them to go over to the other side. That was a command. Now, how many guys believe if Jesus tells you to do something, He's going to help you do it? Right? He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He will complete the good work He started in us. That's what the Word of God says. Do you know how many times in seven years the enemies told me, give up, give up, give up? I don't have a number. Too many. Every week there's a voice in my head that says, give up. You see it? I'm serious. Every week. You'll never, you'll never. When we launched the church, there was a devil in my head said, just quit, just quit. Look, look, I mean, look at what's happening. I mean, the, the, the offering's just not good this week. Not as many people got saved this week. You only had three people get saved this week. Now, some churches, they're like, man, you had three people get saved this year? That's awesome. No, but there, if we had a week that three people got saved, the enemy was like, just give it up. You're not a good preacher. You're not effective. You're not having an impact. Always a voice in your head, right? Wanting you to quit. Wanting you to shut down. And you know what I'd say? I'd say, no, the Bible says that he's the author. He started this work in me. And he's the finisher. And I'm not done yet. Five years ago when we started this property, we started doing all this construction and renovation. There would be voices in my head, you'll never get that done, you'll never get that done. And as soon as we get a project done, I thank God for it, we start another project and there would be a voice in my head saying, "You ain't gonna, that ain't never going to happen, people won't give to that. It ain't going to happen, people are tired of that. People are tired of you casting vision. And then I'd say, no, 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 the Bible says that God will complete the work He started in me. And then guess what? We complete it. Listen to me, write this down if you're a note taker. You'll always win if you don't give up. So Jesus said, push off and go to the other side of the sea. While they were traveling to the other side, there was a storm. There will always be a storm. Can I just take a rabbit trail? Because you know I'm good about doing that. Do you know what was waiting for them on the other side of the sea? 
Bible trivia. The demoniac. You know where they were going? They were going to Gadarene. Where there was a man living in a graveyard. Eaten up with 5,000 devils. And on the other side was where they were going. And Jesus was going to cast 5,000 demons out of that man. And he was going to send that man back into the Decapolis. Which were ten cities. Eaten up with Greek mythologism. And that man was going to start a revival in those ten cities. And then a couple chapters later, Jesus was going to come back through that area, read your Bible, and there would be a mass number of people healed because of what God did in that demoniac. You know why there was a storm? Because the devil knew, I got one of my children on the beach over here. Jesus is trying to mess with him. But my God is always greater. Amen. So they push out. There's a storm that happens. You know the story if you're a student of Scripture. It's Luke chapter 8. The disciples are on the deck, man. They're fighting against the waves. They're fighting against the wind. The water's crashing onto the deck. They are convinced it's over. They're never going to make it to the other side. Where's Jesus? He's in the cabin asleep. So some of the disciples run down to the cabin, wake him up. They can't believe he's so indifferent that he would sleep through a tragedy like this. They're in panic. They wake him up. Do you not care that we're all going to perish? Jesus doesn't say a word. He gets up. He goes up to the deck. He points his finger out over all of that turbulence. And he says, peace be still. And it became as calm the surface of the water did as glass. And he said, oh, where is your faith? It was about ten years ago my family went through a crisis If there was going to ever be a panic moment in our life, it was at that moment. And it was in that time that one night on my way home, I was working out of town. I was driving about two hours back home. And a man I hadn't talked to in two years sent me a text. And this was his text. It didn't start off with, hey Jason, hey man, how you doing? The text simply said this. You can only have authority over the storm you can sleep through. I took that as a word from God. Jesus had authority over that storm because He wasn't panicked over that storm. He walked out while everybody else is fear stricken and everyone else is convinced this the end. Jesus could sleep through it knowing nothing is going to sink me. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the people of God. Amen. Oh, I feel like preaching today. How do you overcome fear? Let me give you three things right now that will help you overcome fear. Here's the first one. Train your mind toward the truth. We have to feed our faith, not feed our fear. I'm going to get in the Word of God more than I'm going to get on the news. It's amazing to me how in times of crisis, in times of panic, we will spend hours on social media reading everyone else's opinion of the matter. We will spend hours on the news Watching every Fox News alert. Can I give you an alert real quick? There's always a Fox News alert. You ever notice that? There's always a situation in Wolf Blitzer's situation room on CNN. Always. And how many of you realize at this point in your life, it's never a good situation in the situation room? It's never a positive Fox News alert. And it's amazing how we will ingest so much of what everybody else says. And so little in those times of what God says. Can I tell you what God says? God says, I know the thoughts I have toward you, says the Lord. They're thoughts not to harm you, but to bless you, to give you a bright future full of hope. Come on, thank God for the goodness of God, for the Word of God. The truth is I can be a word person or I can be a worried person. And I've not always been a word person. I gave my heart to Christ when I was 19. And there had to be some reprogramming happen in my brain because I was naturally bent toward pessimism, toward the negative. 
I remember if my car acted up when I was in high school, I'd tell my dad, motor's blown, motor's blown. Transmission's going out. Well, did you check the fluid? No, but I know it's bad. It's just the transmission's out. Smell antifreeze. Uh, heater, heater core blew on it, and, uh, you know, uh, it, the, the, the floorboard was full of water. No, you had the window cracked when it was raining. I was always bent toward the negative. And something shifted in my life when I went through some hard times. And I realized if I'm going to be who God called me to be, I've got to be a word person. I cannot be a worried person. I've got to be a word person. I decided I'm going to stop worrying. I'm going to start living. Come on, somebody say thank God. Here's the second thing that we need to do to overcome fear. Surround yourself with people of faith. Fear is contagious. If you go back to the story of Moses, God told Moses, when you go into battle, separate from you the fearful. Why? Because fear is contagious. But so is faith. So if you want to be a faith person, surround yourself with people of what? Faith. The third thing you do to overcome fear is you exercise your faith. You know, Scripture says that God gave everybody a measure of faith. How many of you guys have a measure of faith? Raise your hand right now. Okay, well, wait a minute. Not everybody raised their hand. Everybody has been given a measure of faith. That's the Bible. You have a measure of faith. Do you know that God gave everybody muscle in their body as well? Now, some have decided... I'm going to exercise my muscles. I know that's why y'all come every week, just to notice how much I've... Had. No, I'm just kidding. I got a mirror. I know the truth. You know, one morning I was getting ready, and Melissa, she came in the bedroom, and she said, you know, we really ought to start working out. I said, well, seeing as how I'm the only one standing in the bedroom without a shirt on, I guess you're talking to me. Amen. God's given us all muscle. But some people decide to exercise the muscle God gave them. And so they can walk around looking a little bit more ripped than the other person, a little bit more cut than the other person. And how many of you men, let's be honest men, you've looked at another guy that's ripped, you don't want to admit it. You don't want to admit that you looked at another guy that was ripped and thought, dang man, he's looking good. You know, you don't want to admit that because that ain't cool as a man, right? But you know you've done it. Come on, all the men said... You lie, you fry. That's what the Bible says, right? <laughs> and then here's what we do as men. We're, we're like, oh, it's just genetics. That's what we do, ain't it, shy? That's what we do. I remember in high school, I had this uh, friend. His name was Michael. And, uh, man, he was just cut. He was just ripped. And I'd say, you know, he, it's just genetics. That's just, you know, all the men, his family, they just, you know, they just, God just gave them something. He didn't give all the other guys. But, you know, the truth is he's in the gym all the time exercising. You ever looked at somebody and you're like, man, why won't God use me the way God uses them? He can. The Bible says He's not a respecter of person, which means what He'll do for one, He'll do for the other. The difference maker is they've decided to take the measure of faith God gave them and exercise it. When you pray, you exercise your faith. When you declare God's word over a situation, you exercise faith. Your faith. When you proclaim God's hope, God's goodness through Christ, you exercise your faith. That's good. I want to remind you, I'm getting ready to land the plane. The runway is in sight. But I want to remind you that Jesus, when He pulled the twelve together, He told them, Go cleanse the lepers. Do you know what the panic of his day was? Leprosy. It was the most feared illness of his time. Now it was believed back then that leprosy was extremely contagious. So much so that according to the law, you could not, if you had leprosy, you could not live with your family anymore. You were exiled. You were excommunicated. You had to live outside 
the gate of the city. You could not mix with people. You were quarantined. There are still today leper colonies in different places in the world, throughout the world. Leprosy was the most feared thing of Jesus' time. And Jesus said, go cleanse the lepers. So you know what you had to do to cleanse a leper? You had to go find a leper. In other words, what Jesus was saying is, the authority that I've given you is greater than your fear of leprosy. You go invoke my name over that situation, and that situation will submit to my name. Thank God I don't have to live in fear. Throughout every crisis, let me remind you, throughout every crisis, the church has an opportunity to stand up and boldly proclaim the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're watching online, cry out to Jesus. He's all the hope we need. Cry out to Jesus.